Pharrell Williams' song, Happy, resonated with people all over the world. Clap along, give you feel like that's what you want to do. So what does happiness mean to you? Happiness to me is experiencing true joy, where you really feel great inside. Happiness means peace, being content and not worried. I think for the layperson, having a precise definition can almost get in your way. So I think more about being happier. Let's warm them up for the first time and welcome Gretchen and Debbie to the stage. Gretchen Rubin is the New York Times best-selling author whose books and podcasts about happiness have a significant following. You know, I, I was pretty happy, but one of the things that I most wanted to accomplish with my happiness project was, was to appreciate how happy I already was. So the lawyer turned writer set out on a year-long quest because I really had all the elements of a happy life. I, had, I have a great husband, two beautiful daughters. I live in my favorite city in the world. I have work that I love. I have my health. I'm close to my family. But so often I would just get distracted by some petty annoyance or, you know, and, and, not, and really lose sight of how happy I really was. The last 10 to 15 years, there's been a happiness revolution of sorts as people seek help and coaching from seminars, bloggers, and books. But who's the happiest on the planet? A recent UN World Happiness Report shows it's the Swiss and Danes based on how they see their lives. But if you look at how people live their lives, the happiest are apparently Latin Americans. It's true that about 50% of happiness is genetically determined. So some people are born Tiggers and some people are born Eeyores, and that's kind of hardwired. And then about 10 to 20% is life circumstances, age, income, marital status, health. But then all the rest is very much the result of our conscious thoughts and actions. Who doesn't want to be happy? Everybody's looking for happiness. And the recent wave of positive psychology shows us that happiness is a choice anyone can make. We think our circumstances change our happiness a lot, but it really doesn't. About 40% of, of the variance in our happiness is something that's in our control. And that's quite a lot when you think about it. Dr. Wendy Ulrich is a psychologist and author who also researched habits of happiness. And author and motivational speaker Kirk Wilkinson developed his happiness factor principles when dealing with a host of health, employment, and family challenges. But I think sometimes what is missing is the how. That once they make the choice, how do they actually get through what they're experiencing so they can be happy? And adversity and hardship will come. So along with some happiness strategies from our experts, several amazing everyday people will share their stories of perseverance, what they learned experiencing hard things, and how they and you can still be happy on the other side of setbacks and sorrow. The best way to start? Make a conscious choice to boost your happiness, savor your pleasant experiences, and cultivate gratitude and appreciate your life. The research shows that people who are grateful are happier, they're healthier, um, they sleep better. <laughs> um, and one of the great things about gratitude is that it drives out negative emotions. We can't really just produce happiness, but we can produce gratitude. Jeff Olson was feeling very grateful 20 years ago as he admired his sleeping family while driving through southern Utah. It's like time just stood still and I had this absolute moment of gratitude. Just gratefulness for everything that was my life. It was about an hour after that that, um, that everything came apart. In my heart of hearts, what I think happened is I dozed off just, just for a second. The accident reports say it may have rolled at least six to eight times. It was a horrific automobile accident. I had no idea of my injuries. What had actually happened is both of my legs had been crushed and shattered. Um, the left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. My back had been broken in two places. My rib cage had been crushed and my lungs were collapsing. That's why I couldn't breathe. My right arm had almost been torn off and then the seat belt had come through me and ruptured all my insides. I had no idea. I just knew my son was crying and I had to get to him. And that's when the brutal reality hit that no one else was crying. That's when I knew um, that Tamara and Griffin were gone. I mean, I, I was suicidal for a time. I just want to go home. I just want to be done here. And then the choice came, why not create heaven here? 
And it wasn't until I began to ask the what questions that anything shifted. Um, what am I learning from this? I heard an audible voice that only said two words. And it said, choose joy. It's your choice. Come on over here and we'll cook some eggs. And uh, embracing joy is the only thing that's going get to get you out of it. Because otherwise you're going to drown in it. Life is again full of happiness with his wife Tanya, two adopted sons, and Spencer, now married. Jeff wrote a best-selling book 13 years after the accident and now lectures all over the world. You don't get over it. You get used to it. You get used to it and eventually the pain for me began to turn to pleasant, joyful memories. And if I'm going to be happy, then uh, it starts right here before I ever have to look outside for someone else to make me happy. I've got to choose to be happy. Dion Stevenson, the energetic, multi-talented boy with the infectious laugh. He joined the Marines after high school to get out in the world. And uh, he really excel excelled in the Corps, made, made it into Force Recon, and uh, not many guys do. On the night of January 29th, 1991, he ended up in the Battle of Kofji. But uh, an A-10 came in and uh, launched a Maverick MIP, it uh, hit their vehicle and that was it. Six of the seven Marines were gone, killed in friendly fire. I thought, oh, I made it back from Nam, so it, they'll make it back, okay. Lance Corporal Dion Stevenson was only 22. There's not a day that goes by that you don't th think about Dion. I say a prayer about him every day. Dion's brother Sean was a 20-year-old Marine at the time. But then not until I actually picked up Dion's remains in Delaware did, did all that uh, come into uh, reality. So very, very difficult and uh, emotional situation. For a while, I know I was in a state of shock because it was just like a, being a robot. You know, you just kind of did what people told you to do or you just walked around in a fog. But one day I just felt like it lifted. I felt different. It was actually after I went to Mass one Sunday. I hadn't gone to church for a while. It seemed to happen after that. So how does a family survive such trauma? It's uh, the man upstairs. I think you have to have faith. You have to have that foundation. You have to have God in your life. My boys had God in their life. With me, I think it's it's Dion's legacy, having his legacy live on. The Stevensons have handed out 25 annual scholarships at Woods Cross High School in Dion's name, showing their gratitude and giving back. And we've gotten so many letters back from the kids thanking us and that they will live up to Dion's legacy, and it's really amazing. When I look at the situation and the sacrifice that Dion made, it made me realize how much more important life is and to live life fully as Dion did. For me, it's on all the money. In God we trust, and that's the way I look at life. And I seriously, it was one of those like, he can't leave. Like I could just feel it in my soul. Finding happiness through forgiveness when we come back. You don't have to wait for the right moment. You can start to forgive that person right now and feel the benefit of forgiveness. I remember thinking, okay, something's not right with my marriage. Emmett and Ashley were the parents of five children, including a two-month-old. She had no idea the night of March 11, 2011, would be the last time she saw her husband. The truth was, he was having an affair with his paralegal, who had been working for us for a while. And the paralegal's husband was the one that, that shot the gun. It all went down in a Walgreens parking lot the night Ashley found out she was a widow. She also discovered her husband had a secret mistress, filling her with grief, fear, and anger. And you're not only alone, but you weren't enough. And I remember kneeling down like, okay, if there's a God, I need you to do something for me. I need a do-over. This can't be real, and I need, I, need, I need you to fix it. Ashley prayed to God for a do-over and felt pure love. And it just reassured me that I was enough that I was gonna to have to learn to forgive. After a difficult struggle, she remarried, creating a blended family life with Sean and new resolve. I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna fight, and I'm gonna get back where I was, or maybe even more. I'm gonna be happy, and I'm gonna live. You get through forgiving someone when you give it all to Christ and say, all right, I, I understand that you can make up the rest, so this is my opportunity to say, I'm open to your love, to show me how to see other people, to show me how to see myself, 
and to find a purpose and a mission through all that I've been through. She started a blog to help herself heal, but now she's found great purpose in helping others online with her books and the conferences she puts together. To share with other people who feel so alone, who aren't seeing the little moments where angels are there and helping them. It all comes down to one word for Ashley, stand. To be tall, to be proud and say, this is me. And yes, it's been hard. And yes, I wouldn't have chose it if I was given the option. But today I fight to be stronger. We adjust very quickly to new circumstances. And um, a lot of people have found that it's better to invest in experiences than in things. That changing where you live or the job that you do isn't always going to make as much difference as changing the kinds of experiences you're having, the kinds of relationships you're involved in, uh, the, the way you approach life. When researchers study people who are happy, they consistently find that the people who are the happiest are the ones who have loving relationships, and kind of the more loving relationships, the better. Meet Alex Bermudez and his boys from Harlem, New York. I love working with them. They're good kids. Um, they, they kind of relate to me, because most of those kids, they don't have, they, they all grew up in single mothers. It's a lot of gangs, so um, it was dangerous growing up in Harlem. It was pretty rough. But um, as I got older, Harlem, Harlem's changing. So I was kind of lost because my dad wasn't around. But I joined the church when I was 12. And um, I had most of my young, men's, my young men's leader at the time, they was like my dad. So they taught me how to become a good man. Alex served in LDS mission to Georgia, where more close relationships were formed. Those was my, like, my best two years. I learned how to like, love people on my mission, how to do service. Um, I just learned more about the gospel of Jesus Christ when I was on my mission. But more adjustments when he returned. Once I came back home from my mission, I got back to my old patterns of my, of my lifestyle. So it was just that I didn't want to, I felt embarrassed going, going back to church again. It's been hard with trials, ups and downs, trying to get to know myself. Who, who, who is Alex? Who am I? But Alex found himself again with a return to good habits and good friends. I do whatever it takes to keep me positive and hang out with a bunch and hang out with a lot of members in the singles ward. But I, I love to be happy, you know, and have the spirit with me. So I'm trying, I just love staying positive. Still to come, finding happiness while coping with depression and addiction. It was just as easy for me to get pills as it was to go to the grocery store and get groceries. I'm so grateful to be able to turn my mess into a message. Don't let her fool you, Josie Thompson Solomon's happy face on this humanitarian trip is a far cry from the darkness she wrestles every day. And then it was my second year into college that all of a sudden it was like I couldn't get out of bed anymore. The initial diagnosis was major depression and it was five years later perhaps I received the diagnosis of bipolar two. Josie lived with an aunt to get well and eventually received an LDS mission call but the darkness returned a few weeks before leaving, so she stayed home. You know, we were praying and we were fasting, and it just, I just didn't know where my miracle was. To combat the disappointment, she picked up and went on a road trip. And it's the journey that changed my life. Josie lived out of her car and talked to everyone she could. And I'd tell them my story, but most importantly, I'd listen for theirs. And again, I was so inspired. That was the beginning of the 444 Project, Josie set out again cross-country to interview 444 perfect strangers. And I got to ask all these wonderful people what gets you out of bed and prove that no matter who you are, where you've been, where you're going, what you've done, what you're going to do, no matter what, you have a reason to live and a reason to get out of bed. Josie started speaking, blogging, and arranging humanitarian trips. Our motto is to bring joy to the world, you know, and so we help in all sorts of different capacities. In Tanzania, their volunteer group helped the children in an orphanage. The goal and the intent is to serve wherever it's needed. Josie's husband, Brighton, shares her passion to serve. And so it's been a perfect match for me to meet Josie, who, who's every waking moment, if she has this much energy, she spends this much energy helping someone else. And when I lose myself, in the service of others, and I'm able to use my struggles, again, my life challenges as my life mission, and help others, that gives my life meaning, it gives me purpose. 
Yet every day, she still struggles. The day my life changed was when I learned I don't have to be healed to help. And so I, the ironic part about our project, it's all about joy, I seldom feel joy. But I learned that for me, joy takes faith. And the great thing about joy is even when you can't feel it, you can still create it for others. When we're grounded in that sense of why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing, um, that is a huge resource in dealing with life's challenges. Spirituality provides some of those answers for us. Spirituality is key to the addiction recovery program at Renaissance Ranch. It's faith-based, and it worked for Jason Coombs, who runs this center in Meridian, Idaho. And to go from dabbling in high school to being a homeless junkie on the streets of Salt Lake in the winter, it's difficult for me to even put in words what that was like. Jason's problems escalated when a doctor over-medicated him following a 2003 car accident. And I became addicted to Oxycontin. At the time, I felt like it wasn't that big of a deal because it was prescribed, it was legal. My addiction progressed from pharmaceutical pills to heroin and crack cocaine. Jason faced jail time and eventually went through five treatment programs trying to get sober, trying to change. One cold night at Christmas time, he was in a tunnel across the street from the homeless shelter, robbed of his last $10. The thought came to me to reach back out to my family and ask for help one last time. And it, although I didn't act then, I eventually called my mom and I asked her for some help, and this time I meant it. He treated his illness at Renaissance Ranch and says he was reintroduced to a loving creator he'd written off. And so I, I began, began to act my way into faith. Brynn is his wife of five years. When we got married, even then, ultimately, I knew um, it could go any way, and I had to be okay with that. She's helped Jason realize his dreams, having a family, and running his own treatment center. The 12 steps originated with Alcoholics Anonymous and the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints adopted the 12 steps. Those steps are why people recover because they are the practical application of the atonement. I am not even the same person. I talk different, I look different, I act different, I think different, I believe different, and I know that that is my path because I would do it for free. And I do it for free. And I also do it for my career. And I think when the lines blur between work and play, then you know you're on path. Coming up next, pushing through and moving forward when a serial killer snatches your daughter. We are always going to have a new set of challenges, a new set of things that's going to come up and going to be difficult. Whatever happens in your life, you'll be happier if you choose to be honest, avoid drama that doesn't affect you, and give second chances. Your goal is not to get the stone up the mountain. Your goal is to get stronger and stronger as you keep trying. Belva Kent had to be strong for the news she received more than 40 years ago. Her oldest child, Deborah, disappeared from a Utah high school parking lot after serial killer Ted Bundy attempted another kidnapping earlier in the day. They found a handcuff key out of the grass right by where she would have walked out. Eventually, Bundy confessed to the murders of 28 women and was sentenced to death. And then before he was executed, he said he did take Deb and said where he'd put her body. And so at least we had that to go on. Belva waited 15 years, not knowing. And so we went down to the place he said he put her body and um, Jeep Posse down there formed a search group, and they did find a human kneecap. That's all they have left of her. You still have the good memories, but it's still a big loss. That's a big void in your life, and you wonder, how will I move on? But you have the other kids, so you had to move on for them, because they were struggling as much as I was, basically. In Debbie's memory, the Kents still leave their porch light on every night. But with the death of another child, then her husband, it's taken all of Belva's strength to press forward. He's trying to think positive and say this too shall end. Because I think we can do anything we make our mind up to do. 
whether it's a tragedy or happiness, whatever, as long as we're strong and turn to the Lord, why? He always gives us the strength to carry on. A lot of people think I'm a paraplegic, but I'm actually a quadriplegic because I can't move a lot of the muscles in my arm. Nathan Ogden had it all until a ski jump went horribly wrong and he landed on his neck. The very first thing after I stopped rolling, the first thing that popped into my mind was, I gotta get up, I look like an idiot. He worked hard to get strong. And I got back full use of my shoulders, my arms, most of my hands, and even a tiny bit of my legs. Then the unthinkable happened at the hospital. We're still not exactly sure what happened, but I fell off the x-ray table and I broke my neck again. His injuries were worse this time and he went into a mental paralyzation. And once I realized that I'm not going to walk again, that my hands aren't working, my triceps aren't there, my legs aren't going to take a step again, I, I went into a depression. Nathan worked hard to melt his misery to the point where he's now unfrozen. And I think everything in life, your happiness in life comes down to two things to me. It's your hope and your progress. Nathan's faith and family motivate him every day to be more and do more. There are times we definitely have to kick each other in the pants and say, get going. Today is not the day that you're gonna be, you know, depressed or you're not gonna be down today or I know you hurt today, but it's time to go. I like to try and get my heart pumping, but just recently we were down in St. George and we were rappelling off a 150 foot cliff. Been skydiving, river rafting, I tried ice hockey, I've been snow skiing again. I've got to smile. His license plate says it all. Our family motto was, we believe, and that was from the very beginning. We are happy. Every day, we, it's a choice, you know? Every day it's a choice and we choose to be happy. And if you want to be happier, start now to make some small changes. And if you think about getting more of feeling good, less of feeling bad, feeling right about your choices and having an atmosphere of growth, it's a good recipe for a happy life. If you know what happiness is.